Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I would like to welcome you to our seventh day of the 10 days of prayer. I am so happy to be here. I had a good day. And um, we pray that you are being blessed, all of you, wherever you are. This evening, our subject is the love of money and revival. The love of money and revival. Yesterday, we looked at um, excellence, which is the call of God. And we dwelt on the book of Second Peter, um, where the Lord has given us some tenants that if we live by, we have access to all the things that pertain to this life, all the things that pertain to this life. And among those things that pertain to this life is money. The text that I want us to begin with, I think it's one that is very familiar with us, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Those of us that are here who can guess what it says, Mam Gulan has gotten it, except she's speaking shy. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. That's the text. And this is the text that scares Christians from going out to have money. And this is the text, presumably, that supports the notion that holiness or humility is equated to having less money. Now, is that what the text means? And is that the will and wish of God for his children? Especially when you read many other texts, such as the one that we read yesterday, 3 John 2, where God wishes that his children should prosper and then be in good health, to enjoy that prosperity. When we get to texts such as Deuteronomy chapter 8, where God promises us to be the heads and not the tails. When we get to texts such as 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, where God promises to heal the land and, 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 and send away the devourer. How do those things tie in? And then you get to the famous man. God says, try me now and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have enough room to receive. How then does this text tie in? Well, the Bible says the love of what? The love of what? Very good. How many of us here love money? Those of us that are here, please raise your hand. Okay, one, two, three, uh, four. Mama Gulane, you don't love money. Now, how many of us love oxygen? Oxygen. 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 What is oxygen? The air that we breathe. Okay. What is the difference 
between loving oxygen and needing oxygen. I've introduced a new word, need. So which is which now, my order? Do you love oxygen or you need oxygen? Hello? You need oxygen. Why do you say you need oxygen? Isn't loving oxygen good enough? Huh? It's not good enough. Why? You can do with things that you just love. You can do away with things that you just love, isn't it? Can you do all the things that you need? Now imagine if we had to love oxygen to live. How much would it be the root of all evil? When you are about to die, you will do anything to what? To live. Now, perhaps that's the difference that we need to understand. And I am glad the Bible didn't say the need of money is the root of all evil. Have I put my point clear? Now, who has more money? Um, God and Satan. Hello? God has more money than Satan. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am? Oh, there you go. The Lord says the earth is whose? Who knows the verse? Let's begin with Haggai chapter 2 verse 8. What does the Bible say? The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And our measure for money is gold, isn't it? It used to be gold. Now money is just a paper based on nothing. But originally, money was tied to God. And God says the gold is whose? Meaning the money around in this world is whose? Mine. And then Psalms chapter 50 verse 9. What does the Bible say? For every animal of the forest is mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. I know every bird in the mountains. And the creatures of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the whole world is mine. And that is in it. So, does the devil have any money anyway in the first place? Hello? So, whatever the devil is able to reward the sinners with is actually borrowed from who? From God. Now, if it originally belongs to God, who is our father? Whose is all the wealth in this world? Now, you are not responding. Whose is it? Ours. And when you sing, oh yes, I'm a child of the king, his royal blood runs through my veins. What are you saying? You are the child of the who? The king. And all the king's resources are whose? Yours. So how does it become evil to have access to your father's will? Hello? Christians, are we together? How does it become evil to have access to your father's world? How does he become happy when his children are beggars and stragglers? What kind of a father would that be? Happy to have children that are begging while you are lavishly adorned and staying in a lavish place. The foundations of whose city are 12 manner of precious stones.
Why does money seem to be a problem to us Christians? And everything that we do that require money, we try and do it with the minimum most expense. Why? Look at our churches. Of course, nowadays we build better churches like this one. It's, it's fine. It's fair. Very fair. Go in the outskirts and see our churches. Them shakos. You start asking, do they pray God or God sleeping here? Hello? And then look at the churches that our friends build, the Muslims, the Hindus. You've seen the churches, especially the Hindus. They will decorate every square inch of the church with some bait. And then on top, crown it with a gold ceiling. They go all out. For what? To spend. And the reason is, they have the money. They are the great business persons around town. Isn't it so? Yes. When we want to build a church, we have to do 90 building promotions and invite preachers from out of the world to come and motivate us to give. Bring singers from Australia, bring who from where to come and motivate. And when they've motivated us a lot, maybe we'll manage 50,000 for that Sabbath. And then we persecute the brethren every Sunday to come and lay the bricks from the people because we can't hire a contract to do a proper job. And then we say, we belong to God who owns the whole world. I wish on another day, I would tell you about the temple that was built in the wilderness. And how much it was worth. That temple that was built in the wilderness by the children of Israel. Let me quickly move on to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. What does the Bible say? That's a text that we know very well. Seek ye first the what? And it's what? And some of these things will be added unto you. Amen? How many? All these things. What does all mean? It means everything, isn't it? Everything shall be added unto you. Now, Israel, there is no single text in the Bible, where they were taught to go and get rich. It's not there. And there is no text where God commands us to be rich. It's not there. The texts that exist are texts that emphasize our love for God. And remember, love is a choice. Whereas need is not a choice. Hello? You have no choice. Once you are born, you are born to live on oxygen. But money is just a medium of exchange to meet the things that you want. The things that you need. The things that pertain to this life. Both those that you can do away with and those that you cannot do away with. And I thank God because the most critical things about life are free. Air. And for a long time water was free. Until now that human beings are polluting the streams and then we have these complicated ways of having water. But those things that are basic, we're generally free. Now, in 2 Chronicles 7, 
verse 14. The Bible says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will heal them from heaven and I will heal their land. Amen? The Christian's call is to love God, to seek God's face. And when you have loved him and when you have sought his face, his response is to heal your land. Do you notice he didn't say, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will send them the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed? What did he say he will do? Heal their land. What's the story? God intends, God wants us to have an abundant life in all things. And so when we do not have the abundance, then we ought to ask ourselves serious questions. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning from verse 11 up to verse 18. That's a very nice text. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 to 18. Now, this is after the children of Israel have settled in the promised land, the land that was flowing with milk and honey. And this is what the Lord then instructs them. At verse 11, the Bible says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you this day. Lift when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them. And when your heads and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying desert with fierce serpents and scorpions and first ground where there was no water. Who brought you water out of the rock? And it goes on and on and on. Verse 17 says, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and mighty has gotten me this well. And verse 18, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he saw to your fathers as it is to this day. That, brethren, is the whole reason why we as God's children are struggling. We are very quick to forget who supplies our needs. Philippians 4 verse 13, what does the Bible say? I can do all things through Christ who does what? And gives me what? Through Christ who gives me, gives me what? Strength. Now Israel had been strictly warned. When everything has increased, remember the Lord. The challenge is when you have everything, you tend to be self-reliant. And when you are self-reliant, you tend to delegate God to the background. And haven't we seen this among God's children? A brother has been struggling, has been struggling, and then God blesses him with a good job, and he starts coming to church once in a blue moon. He becomes extremely what? Busy with God's thing, and forgets to be busy with the honor of the thing. 
Now, those that get wealth from the devil, the stories I hear are that that wealth comes with rules. Has anyone ever heard that story? Huh? Those that get wealth from the devil, that wealth comes with what? Rules. And as long as you follow the rules, you have the what? The wealth. When you break the rules, the wealth also does what? God has given us rules. Are we willing to follow them? And that's where we have a very big question. There's a text that I don't read that often to Christians. Romans chapter 8 verse 13. The Bible says, Do not owe anybody anything except love. Now when God's children are engrossed in death, who is pleased by that? We have very interesting stories in the Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 27. This is the story of the rich young ruler. We know him. He came to Jesus and said, what do I do to be saved? And Jesus says, what do you read? And the young man says, honor the Lord your God with your heart. And then and he gives all those ten commandments. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And the young man says, these things I have kept, this I was what? You, what more do I lack? And Jesus says, go sell what you have, come and follow me. And the Bible says, the young man went away sorrow. Why was he sorrow? And they say, it's because he had great wealth. But I'll tell you, he actually didn't have great wealth. There were men before him that had much more greater wealth. The story of the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. The man plowed, he worked very hard, and then he harvested, and then he put in the bands, and then he tells himself, relax, oh my soul, you've got plenty laid for you for many years. And that night, God said, you fool, this very night, your saw is required. What was the problem with these two guys? The problem is that they were rich. Is it? Hello? No. The problem is not that they were rich. They were not as rich as Job. We know Job? That old man who was stripped of everything, including his children. And yet he couldn't forsake God. They are not as rich as Abraham. Not as rich as David. Not as rich as Solomon. I love the story of Solomon. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 to 9, Solomon asks for two things from God. Of course, that's besides the world, the wisdom that he asked for. You remember that story? Now, in Proverbs, Solomon says, Oh Lord, give me two things and don't deny me. You will not make me rich, lest I forget you and say, who is the Lord? And then he says, do not make me poor, lest I steal and profane your name. You remember that prayer? And if we would pray that prayer, we might be close to how Solomon was. Now, Solomon was not rich. Solomon was not what? Get to 1 Kings chapter 4. I love that story. 1 Kings chapter 4. Where is 1 Kings? It's just near revelation in the New Testament. Is it so? Verse 22. Now this was Solomon's table. This was Solomon's who? Now Solomon was a rich man. He asked not to be rich and not to be poor. So he was just in the middle. He was where? The Bible says, on verse 22, Solomon's provision for one day
was 185 bushels of flour. 375 bushels of meal. 10 fatted oxen. 20 cattle. 100 sheep, deer, gazelle, rebok, and uncounted number of bears. That's how many news. One me. Per day. Huh? My friend, this was serious what? Now, 1,085 bushels of flour. That is, if you want to understand it in our terms now, 3.4 tons of flour. 3.4 tons of flour. I will break it down. That is talking about 178, 25 kgs of flour. One meal. 178. Now, 375 bushels of meal, millimeal. That is 6.9 tons of millimeal. That is 279 kgs. 279, 25 kgs for one meal. Then you're talking about 10 fatted oxen and you're talking about 20 cattle. That's 30 beasts for one meal. And this was not a rich man. He was just in the middle. That's what he had asked. Some of us, if you eat a whole chicken in one sitting, it's when you have just been paid. And even when it's just payday, you make sure you divide the chicken into nice pieces. Now here, they are talking about unable to count the chicken, the guinea fowls, all those ones. Those were just basel. And he was not rich. Talk about Abraham. Abraham was not rich either. But when, Adam, when Abraham's nephew, Lot, was captured by five kings that came to fight Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham went to rescue Lot with his army. When the Bible says he had 300 trained soldiers born in his house, they were just sitting around and guarding his wealth. One man with an army that could go and defeat five kings. And he wasn't rich. He was just. And Abraham is a friend of who? God. There are so many stories I can give. The problem is how we relate to God. The problem is how we relate to what God has given us. Let us not deceive ourselves, my Christian brothers and sisters. If we don't have the means of life, let us genuinely ask ourselves, can God trust me to handle his wealth? If he can, he will give you as much as you can handle and still honor him and still respect him. The challenge here, immediately you have 1,000 pula to retain a hundred pula is a what? Big challenge. And sometimes because of our inability to be grateful to God, we end up limiting how much he can give us as he is trying to save us into the kingdom. And remember, tithe is proportionate to how much you have, isn't it? He gives you 1,000. What is the tithe? 100. And then what's the offering? A minimum of 100. Hello? Hello? And look at our church copper. Most of us are eager to return the tithe 
But the offering, and we want God to bless us when we are not acknowledging his gifts. Now remember, tithe increases with the amount of money that you have what? Received. When you have 100,000, what's the tithe? 10,000, isn't it? And most of us here, if God gave you 100,000, to bring a 20,000 to church, you start calculating. No, the Lord understands. At least when I have taken 10,000 tithe, it, it's good enough. Then this 10,000, you have limited yourself. There are men and brethren that have been very faithful in returning tithe when they had what? Little. The more they have, it becomes a what? And God in heaven is watching and he cuts you down to the right side. And then you say it's God's will. It's God's will. I am really, really fighting against that notion. And that's why I'm saying in these 10 days of prayer, if we have to get our lives revived, we should realize that God intends us to be held all around. We cannot be revived in the spirit only and our money is not affected. We cannot be wholehearted Christians but are still grudging to give. And most of us Christians have this problem of giving. The men of God have preached so much about tithe and we are good in returning tithe. But remember, you have not started giving when you have returned tithe. Amen? You have not started what? Giving when you have returned what? Tithe. And God's blessings are dependent on how benevolent you are. And benevolence is the giving above the mandatory to return. Now, check your life. Wherever you are, wherever you are listening to, why don't you have all that God wishes that you could have? Perhaps your giving is actually limiting him. He has not learned to trust you with his wealth. You have not developed a relationship that allows you to receive freely from him. Remember what you said. Freely you have received, freely do what? Give. The problem is not the money. The problem is our relationship with him. When we can make our relationship based on what? When we can make our relationship not based on what he is going to give us, then we are almost in the right place. The story of the three Hebrew boys comes into my mind. You remember, after everyone had bowed down and they wouldn't bow, then they brought them to the king. And the king said, hit the furnace seven times. And then the king says, I will give you an opportunity again. To rethink. Do you know what their answer was? Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this what? In this matter. The God that we say is able to deliver us from your who? Your hand. This is the statement that I like after that. But even if he does not deliver us, we are not going to worship your image. Amen? Now, their obedience to God was not dependent on the fact that he was going to deliver them. They knew he would deliver them. They knew. They knew he would deliver them. They knew with all their heart that God was going to deliver them. No, 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 no. That God was able to deliver them. Amen? They knew. 
and they told the king, the God whom we save is able to deliver us from your hand. He's able. But, oh king, we don't save him because he's able to deliver us. We save him because he's God. And so even if he chooses not to deliver us, let it be known, O oh king, that we will not save your idols. Where are the Daniels? Where are the Mishans, the Abednegoes, and the Shadrachs of this time? Where are they? Most of us have followed Christ because we are looking for bread. And it doesn't work like that. He's able to give us the bread. But his ability to give us the bread is not the basis of us following him. Yesterday's sermon ties in exactly with today's sermon. Trust in God. Love him with all your heart. And take up the opportunities he gives you. And he will bless you without the result. I challenge us Christian brothers. And I challenge us so very honestly. That we may seek him and seek revival indeed. And when we have sought revival, let us go do our best to make our lives and the lives of all. God's children around us better. The challenge that most of us have is laziness. Most of us Christians are lazy. Yesterday we talked about excellence. Most of us want to do the minimum most for the maximum must pay. I was in town a few days ago at the bus rank there. I met a woman. They were, she was not talking to me. They were chatting with friends. He says, hey, this COVID data, it has done me very good. I'm just sitting at home and I wish it can continue. I'm just sitting at home and then I looked at her and the friend says, ah, can I when I am free? He says, ah, is it my problem? It's COVID. So now I just go and sit at home, month and the money. And there are so many of us Christians that identify with that spirit. If you can sit and get paid for sitting, we will sit and get paid for what? Sitting. But that's breaking the commandment. Amen? It's breaking God's commandment. Six days you shall do what? Labor and do all what? Now when you have not labored, you've been sitting the whole week, and then you come to rest on the Sabbath. You are a lawbreaker. And most of us don't have on the basis of our laziness. And our laziness causes us to miss opportunities. And when we get opportunities, we are not excellent about developing them. I don't want to go through yesterday's presentation. But if you combine it with this notion and this belief that we are sharing today, we are going to be different people. We are going to be different people. And there will be no room for us to be proud. Why? Because all that we have and all that we are is not ours. It is given in trust by who? By God. For the beauty and blessing of all of you, God's children. I speak again about our Asian brothers. Hello? You see how intertwined they are in their networks? Hello? And we too could be better if we became intertwined in our businesses as God's children. God intended Israel to be a self-sustaining economy on their own. 
They didn't need external help. Everything should have been found in there. And he laid down rules how they are going to do business with each other versus how they are going to do business with external friends. You know, Israelites could lend a foreigner on interest. You know that? Yes. When a foreigner comes to borrow, lend them and hammer them with interest. When your brethren come to borrow, give them without what? Interest. God intends us to work together. And much of our financial problems as Christians is our failure to work together. You know that the elder is a plumber. When you need a plumber, you go and bring a heathen who doesn't even return what? Hey. You know that the sister is a teacher. When you want tuition for your children, you go and get a heathen to come and tutor your what? Your children. And they end up molesting them. Is it a brother in the church that can do the job? Amen? Now let us look at religion as practical brothers and sisters. Let's look at religion as practical. And that is what it is. My time is up. May God bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. May God help us realize that we need as much as we need to be spiritual and heavenly minded, we need to be of earthly good. Amen. Tomorrow we will be looking at leftovers. And the title is Leftovers, Don't Throw Them Away. Most of you here, you throw leftovers in the bin too much. And you're wasting God's money throwing leftovers. You dish, and you know your stomach is this small, you dish like that. And you think God in heaven is smiling at you. I've blessed my child well. They can eat and they have something to spare. Then you throw in the bin. Come tomorrow. May God bless us as we seek revival. Amen.